Hey there, it's Katie Jarvis with Managing the Mess. If we haven't met before, I'm a K-6 through elementary art teacher, and I teach right here at a Title I school just outside of Washington, D.C. I make art room management videos to help make your job easier and help you feel a little bit less alone in this crazy career. This week, I'm going to be explaining one of my management techniques, which is a happy and sad board. The happy and sad board is a behavior management strategy for the entire class. I've got separate videos with individual management strategies that I use, but this is for the entire class to give them feedback on how things in the class are going. If I see the class do something really great, I put up a point, they wait for it, wait for it, then I point to them and they say, oh yeah. If they get a reminder about the rules, I put one up on the frown side. Again, I point to them, but then they say, oh. So it's an exaggerated sound for the happy and the sad marks. Now, why I like that is it gets everybody's attention and they catch on that things are going well, we're doing a good job and they feel validated or they're hearing that sad sound and they know something's not quite right and that they need to pay attention and listen and fix things. So what goes on with these numbers? What happens if the smiles win or the frowns win? Well, in my classroom, it equates to a gold or silver paintbrush award. For example, if there is a tie, the score is three to three when art finishes, the class would take a silver paintbrush back to the teacher. Now, this is simply a chipwood brush. You can get this at Lowe's or Home Depot, pretty inexpensive. I use the one inch size and I spray paint it with silver spray paint. I like to attach a like plastic lanyard string to it so that teachers can hang this up in their classroom. They return it each and every week as their class has to re-earn the brush. They would get this if there is a tie. They would also get silver if the score had been very close. So let's say the score was four to three. The smiles only won by one point. That's too close, okay? That would be a silver paintbrush. Now, if the smiles had won by two points. So now the score here is five to three. The smiles won by two points. The class would take the top award home. It's kind of like the Olympics, the golden paintbrush. The golden paintbrush is a two inch size paintbrush, spray painted gold, and this is the top award. Now, if the smiles win by any more than two, it's still the golden paintbrush. Now, for example, if the frowns had won, so let's say this final score was two to three, the class would take nothing back to the classroom teacher. And this is just a very quick thing. When the classroom teacher comes back, they're kind of looking, is there a gold brush? Is there a silver brush? Is there no paintbrush? So they know how the day went. I don't stop and give them a rundown about what happened in art. I have a little form that I use called an art room support report. If you're interested in taking a peek at this, it's over on Teachers Pay Teachers. I explain my management technique to the teachers on the back, but on the front, this is when I'm recording what happened with our score here. Did we get gold or silver? You just circle at the bottom. And then there's a spot in the middle there that I'm using for individual behavior. So if an individual student is not helping us to earn the golden paintbrush or the class is working on something, maybe the whole class uh, needs to work on working a little bit more quietly or something like that, or there's just way too many bathroom breaks, something like that I need to communicate, I put that on the note. In addition to behavior things, on this note, I would put if someone had to go to the clinic, if somebody left early, if there was an argument between two students. And I'm not asking that the teacher take care of anything on this note, it's just kind of like an FYI. Um, if a student receives a time out, I would let the teacher know that I am going to be contacting their parents. I let them know that, you know, I'm going to be sending an email later on today or whatever my plan is. So they're kind of looped into what is going on. And my classroom teachers really do appreciate that information. I got a lot of questions over on Instagram about what exactly do I give points for? And it's a really good question. Um, you could arrange certain things that you're looking for, have it in a visible list and kind of use this as a check sheet. And then that gives and determines your score for me. 
I've been teaching a long time. I just like a little bit of flexibility. I know that, you know, one day it doesn't look exactly like the next as an art teacher. So I don't have a list. I have kind of routines that I normally go by of what I give points for. So I'm going to share that. But do know you could put this in a list. You could have a little chart that you check off um, on your board. The first thing I give my students a point for usually is for how they come in because that's a really big deal for setting the tone for how the class is going to go. So from the beginning of of the year I had printed out this little social story um, you can find different social stories um, I don't sell any but other sellers on teachers pay teachers do um, look for kindergarten teachers or special education teachers they often use these and they have some that you can modify for the art room so I use some of their clip art and their little framework here to create an entering the art room social story at the beginning of the year for the first few weeks of school I go out in the hallway and I teach this to my kindergartners, all the way up to my sixth graders. I go over this, I go over this, I go over this. So my students are very clear on what's expected. So then I have this as a slide. So after they come in for my opening routine, and I have a video, a couple of videos about what I do to start art. So look around if you're kind of looking for a routine to start things out. But in my slides, right after we do our greeting, that picture comes up with that social story. And I stop and reflect. Hmm, did you guys come in quietly and stay in your line? Were people, you know, having their eyes forward and their ears ready to listen? And then that's when I'm giving the first point. So they're immediately getting feedback and they see the importance of how they come in to the art room. And if things didn't go well, that's when we're stopping and acknowledging that and giving them a chance to turn things around. Um, and that's what I think is also great about this. It kind of is fluid and it keeps going through the art class that I can catch them doing a good job, even if things started off kind of rough. Um, the second point I usually give is my students will recite the art room rules each and every week. I mix it up. I use whole brain teaching and we use a lot of different kinds of voices and styles, but it's a great way to start your art class. If you're looking for ideas and you want to incorporate that in your art room too, I have a freebie over on Teachers Pay Teachers with the different voices that we use. But the students, they move their hands, like rule number one, listen when the teacher is talking. They move their hands and they use their voices to recite the rules. So if most of the class is helping us and participating and everyone's kind of looking and listening, that could be our second point. We get a point just for helping with the rules, kind of resetting things and setting the tone for the class. But students have to participate in that actively, not just like sitting there and staring at me. Um, the third point that I give is for listening. So after we go through the rules, I review a Mona Lisa listening. I always have a Mona Lisa hanging up in my room, but I have a slide that comes up after the rules where we check. I say Mona, they say Lisa, Mona, Lisa, Mona, Lisa. And I check that their hands are still, their eyes are forward, their lips are zipped. And then a few minutes later, kind of look and see into my lesson. Am I still having good listening? Are we still in that Mona Lisa listening? And that's when I give them a little bit of feedback and a point. Sometimes it's at the end of my lesson. Sometimes I kind of stop midway through if I notice things are going really, really well or not so well because it gives them a chance again to turn things around. Um, so the fourth point I would give is I give out jobs and the students will get started on their jobs. The people on the carpet would be waiting until the job uh, helpers get started, but I give them a task. Like if you're sitting on the carpet, I need you to go over and get an art shirt and then go and take down your chair and sit down and wait for the helpers to bring the supplies to you. And I look at like how people are doing with the task of helping, with what the people that weren't helping needed to do just for themselves, um, and watch as people start to work. And that is a point. Like, are people starting on their own or am I having to repeat what is needed, you know, for those directions? Um, and really be careful with any of these with your points that you have clearly taught these routines. I have a video um, where I talk about do you give good directions? It's something that I often reflect on because a lot of times I'll hear just like things randomly in the hallway. Teachers, well, you know, show me how the line's supposed to look. You know, we need a good line or something like that. And I don't know if kids know exactly what that means. So make sure that you're giving very clear and specific directions. In art, that often means visual directions. It's not just saying and spewing out all these words, especially if you teach younger students, especially if you teach special needs students, especially if you have multi-language learners in your school. But having visuals to go along with your directions, 
is just good teaching. You're going to see your student behavior increase when things are very clear about what you expect. And having it visually really does help. Um, the next point that I give is for my students working quietly. So I give a point just kind of like right as things get going. But I would say like midway through the class, I kind of reflect to myself like, how is this going? Are they working quietly? For the most part, uh, my students are working quietly, especially in my upper grades, because I've discovered podcast. Okay. Check out my video on podcast. I've got a couple of recommendations on things that really engage my students and keep them working quietly. So I wouldn't interrupt the podcast to give feedback for them uh, if it's going well. But if I have to stop the podcast ever and remind people about our rules for the podcast, then I would put up a frown. Um, I give them a point um, when it is time to stop working. So I use a time timer in my classroom. When the timer goes off, I blink the lights. And the first thing I say to my students is macaroni and cheese. And they reply, everybody freeze. Each and every time I tell them, we are not walking, we are not talking. The secret signal is I'm going to turn the lights on when I want you to move. And then as I start to give my directions, I say, in a minute, not yet. And I explain what's going to happen when the lights turn on. This is really hard. So it's something that you do need to practice. And a lot of times students just really want to be helpful or they really want to try to finish something. So I do always try to stop and give a point for how they are freezing, okay? Did everybody stop and look and listen like we have learned? We put it on this side at the end of our freezing or if there are people moving around or I had to give reminders about what freezing is and what is needed beyond that initial uh, reminder, then we're putting up a frown. The next point we give after the cleanup has ended. So I have my students finish the cleaning up and then go back to their seats. Um, for kindergarten and first grade, they tend to go right to lining up and not go back to their tables. With the upper grades, they go back to their tables. The kindergartners and first graders, this is happening in line. But I ask them to reflect, how do you think our cleanup went? Would you give yourselves a thumbs up for cleaning up, a thumbs to the side, or a thumbs down? And we have a little conversation about how that went. And then based on that conversation, and, and more importantly, what I'm thinking happened um, and how I feel it went, they get a point as well. Um, an additional point I will often get for lining up because they do have to line up silently. They're going to be moving as soon as their teacher comes and they need to be ready for the hall. I think it's really important um, if you want teachers to be on time to your class for lining up uh, at the beginning and for picking up at the end, you need to make sure that they are ready. Um, if they know that you're going to have the class there silently waiting for them, they're going to make every effort to get there. Now, of course, there's meetings, there's other things, but they really will try their best for you. If you put in that effort of making sure that you have your art things wrapped up and cleaned up and you've got that quiet line ready to go. What I like about not having a specific checklist written down is I can be really fluid with this and change things as I go. I like to make sure that I put up a frown if I have to correct an entire table or a portion of the class for not following one of the rules. Because we go over the rules in my art class every single week. Okay, My students can say them without me even helping them. They know what they are. So when I have to give an additional reminder, it's the second time in the art class they have already um, heard about that. So I would put up a frown. Another thing I like to do is if my directions are ignored. If I give a direction to say, you know, in a minute, not yet, we're going to line up to get our art shirts. We're going to make sure that we are being respectful, responsible, and safe and using our walking feet to walk over to the art shirts. If I give that direction, 30 seconds later, the class is running for the art shirts. I would stop everyone and I would put up a frown and we would talk about how that direction was ignored. Um, I think that that gives you even more authority that you're not just letting problems um, get ignored. Uh, you know, you're not forgiving them for little mistakes and stuff like that. You're making sure that you're holding them accountable with the score as to what actually took place during the art class. Sometimes if things are a little bit chaotic, especially, you know, you talk about like the older grades, we might stop and when we're doing like the cleanup reflection, 
if there was something that I noticed, um, you know, even from earlier in the class, if I didn't quite have time to come over and put up the points, I'll say, you know, I'm really sorry. I was busy helping people, but today I noticed people were not sharing the materials and Mrs. Jarvis had to get involved in several situations, telling people that they needed to ask a friend to pass them something or take turns so that everyone at the table could use that material. So, you know, we're going to be putting up a frown. So it's okay to like admit when you make a mistake or, you know, you were very busy and you couldn't do it right in the moment to say that and acknowledge that before the class leaves. If it gets out of control and you really can't deal with it, or, you know, sometimes there's like a mess. You don't even notice it until they leave that like they left paintbrushes in all of your sinks. That's something that I would start the next class with. I wouldn't start off with a frown or a smile um, based upon something that happened the previous class. Uh, I would give them a fresh start, but I would definitely make sure I acknowledge. You know, last week I noticed we had people really confused about where the paintbrushes go and they were in all of our different sinks. So I have a picture here. This is our paintbrush bubble bath. Make sure today when you are cleaning up and you're finished painting that you walk your paintbrush to this sink that you see here in the picture. This is sink number two. You can tell that because there is a number two above the picture in the sink. There is a big giant yellow crayon above this sink. Point to where this sink is in the room. So I'm making sure when I'm giving the frowns that I'm using that as a teachable moment with my students. And also I'm acknowledging for when things are going really well. And I really try hard to focus on the positive and catch them doing a good job and really build them up and make a big deal about that. I think focusing on the positive things and being as proactive as you possibly can is going to cut out a lot of your behavior problems. I sure hope this video was helpful for you. I'll see you in my next video.